And we could tell what something was by looking across and down. So if there was a number in here, would say, OK, we know that that's gas for April. All right, would see across and down. So that's what I mean by a table. So we're going to look what is in HTML to put that in. Because if you think about it, <coughs> as simple as this sounds, with what we've learned so far, it would be very difficult to implement, right? Because we created an HTML document. And we tried to do something like that. would find out real quickly that we don't really have the tags to do that. Let's put these tags in here to start. Show you how to try to do it the wrong way and then show you how to do it the right way. So you might think, well, we could do something like this. Month electric gas cell phone, et cetera, and then put in January. And February, and so on. Of course, what's going to happen if we save this and view this as an HTML document? What's it going to look like? It's going to look like just one long line of data. Exactly. Because if you remember, formatting within an HTML document, any white space in an HTML document gets reduced to a single blank space. So if we went and, view, and viewed this within our web browser, as predicted, just one long line of data. All right. Now, uh, the interesting thing is, is even if we could figure out a way to space it out, it would be very fragile. In other words, if something changed on a different device or any different circumstance that you might have, it would stop working the way we would want it to. So therefore, there's a set of tags that handle this for us, and it's a table tags. All right? Now, uh, with table tags, uh, the thing to keep in mind is you should only use table tags to do something like this to do a table of data, OK? Uh, that sounds odd, but in the past, before CSS was widely accepted and widely used, people would use table tags to get the alignment correct on their page. In other words, they would create big tables that had two rows and two columns in it and use that to get the layout that they wanted by putting the logo in one part in one cell, the title in another cell, the navigation in a third cell, and so on. Well, that was clever for the time, but now with the use of CSS, 
you don't need to do that and it's very limiting. It's very limiting because if you set up a table like that, uh, it's not very flexible. And you can't easily give a different appearance on a cell phone versus a desktop version of the page and so on. So it's just not very flexible at all. So <coughs> use tables for their proper use, to show a table of data, not to get the alignment that you want on a web page. Use a grid, uh, a grid layout or use a, uh, a flexbox layout to do something like that to get the, the layout. So anyhow, there's really, there's a handful of very basic tags with tables and then there's a few extra tags with tables that we're going to look at. There also is a, uh, an issue relating to accessibility for tables. The exact similar thing that we, the exact similar thing, that doesn't make sense. The similar thing that we run into labels, right, uh, on forms. In other words, we can visually see, we can visually determine that this label is next to this text box so we know that that label goes with that text box. But someone that can't see has a harder time with that. Therefore, a label tag helps point and link those two things together. So we have a similar thing with tables, whereas we can see at a glance what row and column a piece of data is in, whereas someone that can't see can't easily determine the row and table. So we have a few extra uh, tags, or not tags, but attributes for accessibility that helps people uh, be able to determine the contents of a table. And then there's a few styling issues. So we'll cover this uh, today and probably a little bit on Wednesday. And then we'll start the home stretch of the course where we talk about JavaScript, which is kind of a fun section. It's really just an introduction to JavaScript. Uh, you're welcome to take it as far as you want to. Uh, I'll go over some very basics of it. And uh, then it's just a matter of getting your project done and the rest of the assignments. So I think I've posted all the assignments in this class. So that's good news. The, the end is near. We're on the home stretch. All right. So let's look at this. All right. First of all, we have the table tag itself. And the table tag goes around the entire table, as you might imagine. Simply put, a table is a collection of rows. And the rows are TRs. TR stands for table row. We then have each row consists of a number of cells. Okay? A cell is an individual field where you can put a piece of data. And there are two kinds of cells. There's TDs and THs. TD stands for table data, TH stands for table header. So the top row is going to be all headers, right? So if we're going to duplicate what I had before, we have a TH for month because it's a, it's a column header. We then have a TH for electric bill. We then have a TH for, whoops. Gas bill. We then have a TH for housing, let's say. Or fousing, if you'd rather. TH for food, and so on. These are T 
THs are table headers. They tell you what the column represents. Typically, they're going to be the first row in your table. All right? You then are going to have each subsequent TR might have sort of a TH because uh, in the first column because that's sort of a row header. So if we're going to break things down by month, January might have one value, February might have another, and so on. And I'll just put some numbers in here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time thinking about it, but we'll put just some numbers in here. Then I'm going to copy. Uh, these cells, however, are actually data. January, I'm going to call a header because it simply says what the row is. It's the budget for January. And I'm going to duplicate this a few times so that we have a few rows in, in the table. All right, so if we're going to look at this now, we'll notice that everything is lined up. All right. Now, this isn't a particularly easy table to read because the, the headings sort of blend in together. All right, but we'll see what we can do to fix that. Let's make a few observations. What's the difference between a TH and a TD? THs are bold. That's one difference. What's another difference between a TH and a TD? A little hard to tell uh, unless you look at the month column. The data in THs is centered. All right. Now, with these columns, it's kind of hard to tell because the whole column width it, it's taking up. But in this case, the header takes up the whole width, or, or the, the, the header is centered within the, the whole width of the column. TDs, on the other hand, are left justified or left aligned and are not bold. Now, here's a question I hope that you can get even without me talking about it. If I wanted the numbers to be centered and bold, would I make them THs? No. All right? They're not table headings, right? You don't use the tag to get the way the, the, the way the page you want to look, you get the page to describe what the data means. And in this case, this is still a piece of data. So it should be in a TD. It's not a heading. That 123 is not a heading. So therefore, it should not be in a TH tag. Yes? Exactly, that's CSS territory. In HTML, you describe what that content means, what it represents, what kind of information is it. And in this case, that is table data. All right? Now, the way that you want that to look is CSS. Maybe table data, I want to be centered and bold. And if I do, then I make it CSS. All right? Then I do it through CSS. And that's true across the board, all right? Uh, this is just probably one of the most obvious examples of this, all right, where I would say, yeah, if you want it to look a certain way, 
Uh, it doesn't mean that you give it that HTML tag. It means that you can you give it the proper HTML tag based on what that portion of the screen, what that text means. And it means data. It is data. And then you style it to get it the way that you want to. All right, let's make a couple other observations about this. First of all, how wide is each column? Exactly. It's as wide as the longer piece, longest piece of data in that column is. So in this case, February is the longest string of text in this column. So February sets the size. And it, the column is that big. In the rest of the columns cases, the heading, electric bill, gas bill, housing, and food are the biggest things. So that sets the side. The width of the row is simply the sum of the width of the columns. All right? And by default, there's no grid lines in the table, which you can put, or you, but you don't have to put. All right, let's play around with the styling of it. All right? And I'm going to go in and I'm going to create a style sheet. I'm going to start by giving the table a width. So I'm going to give the table a width of 70%. Now remember, whenever I give a width that's a percentage to something, that's a percentage of the available space. Now in this case, the table is inside the body. All right? So therefore, the available space is the entire screen width, all right? Uh, it's the entire window width, I should say, that the browser's in. So it's going to be 70% of that, which is 70% is of the entire uh, width of the screen. All right, let's go and save this as, what did I call it? Main.css, style.css. If you notice, it now takes a different width. And if I resize it, oops, it'll resize it. And it'll even break the line in the two if needed to fit things in. Notice how it sort of keeps the columns proportional, all right? In other words, it might be a little hard to see, but month, if you compare month and electric bill, the longest word in this one is February. The longest word in this one is electric bill. Electric bill is longer than February, therefore this column gets a little more space than that column. So it spaces them out proportionately, all right? Maybe more obvious at the, at the wide setting, that that is wider than any of these other things because electric bill is the widest thing uh, in the entire table. 
It will break it if it can, but it will not break a word in the middle of it. So where there's a space, it will break it and wrap it to another line. Where there, where there is not a space, though, like at this point, where it breaks it, it's not going to like drop the C down to the next line or something like that. It will never break a word uh, in half. Now, if the table was inside of something, like if I put the table inside an article, and I give a width to the article, that's going to affect the width of the table. So if I gave an article a width of 700 pixels, then the table is going to take up 70% of that 700 pixels. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the article is inside the table, or the other way around, table's inside the article. Therefore, if I give a width to the article and make it 700 pixels, and the table is 70%, it's always 70% or whatever percentage of the available space. So in this case, the available space is 700 pixels. The width is 70%. So this would actually be always 490 pixels, the width of this table. And it doesn't matter. If we make it bigger or smaller. Now, if we made this let's say 80%, then the article's got to be 80% of the entire width of the window. The table's going to be 70% of that. And therefore, it will be relative, and it will adjust. Got to save it. Yeah, there you go. And of course, you can always give a minimum width with any of these, which is useful on mobile devices. So maybe you could say minimum width 400 pixels. So no matter what, it doesn't get any smaller than 400 pixels. minimum width 300 pixels. It's not really showing what I want to show. There we go. So it resizes, but it won't make it any smaller than that. Let's try this might be a little better for what I want to illustrate. Right, it's bigger as I make it smaller, it stops at a certain point. OK. One thing I recommend doing, by the way, if you're never sure, if, if you're ever unsure about why something is laid out the way it is, What's useful to do is to give temporarily the different things on your page a background color or a border or something like that. So even if I don't want a border in the finished page, if I wasn't sure like why this is this big, I could go in and say, 
Well, the table, I'm going to give a background of yellow. And the article, I'm going to give a background of red. And I usually make them real obvious so it stands out. And then you can see, OK, that makes sense now. As I make that smaller, it resizes, but it stops at that point. OK? What if I wanted to center the table? All right? I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave the colors on it at least for a little while. What if I wanted to center the table? Well, we've seen how to center things in the past. Let's try that. I'm going to say margin 0px auto. That isn't exactly centered. But I think with the colors, we can see why, right? The table is centered within the article, but the article is not centered within the page. All right, it's a little bit off. So what we can do, the way to correct that is we have to center the article within the page. And then everything should be centered OK. All right, now it's centered correctly. And it stays centered until it just gets too small. Questions so far? Now, I said, what if we wanted the TDs to be bold and uh, centered? Again, we would not do that via changing the HTML. We'd change the CSS to say TD, text align. Center. Font weight bold. And that puts everything like that. Now, it probably is good to have your THs and TDs look a little different from each other so that the THs stand out. Remember, we don't just do things to make them look nice or pretty, all right? So when we talk about, like, for example, adding colors, one of the things that colors can represent is different meaning, right? If you see five things on the page that are blue and five things on the page that are red, your mind is going to, even if you don't think about it, your mind is going to group them into well, those are the blue things. They have something in common. And those are the red things, and they have something in common. So therefore, as a designer, you want to help people make those mental associations. All right? You want to make it easy for the people by guiding them, and guiding them visually through the page to say, oh, OK, I see. It's a little bit bigger, so that's different. All right? So the things that are a little bit bigger, those are headers. All right. And again, people don't say that subconsciously. You know, they don't say that consciously in their head. It happens on a subconscious level. But you can give different looks to things on the page just to make it look, first of all, it does make it look a little bit nice and not quite as plain. But secondly, it helps convey that extra piece of information to the user. So I'm going to get rid of these columns or these colors because they serve their purpose. And I'm going to say, OK, maybe we make the table as a whole
have a color of black, which we really don't have to do, right? Because that's the default of the browser, but doesn't hurt. And maybe we make the color of this some shade of gray. So now, those things sort of stand out. Okay. Now, what if we had something that we want to highlight on this table? Like, hey, maybe in January in Ohio, your gas bill's really high. You'd use either a class or an ID. All right? Depends if there was really literally only, only one thing on the page that you wanted to highlight, you could use an ID. If there were maybe different things that you wanted to highlight, like the gas amount, the gas bill in January, the food amount in December or November, let's say, and so on, then you could give a class. All right? So let's show you how to do it both ways. With an ID, I'm going to give it something that's descriptive. In other words, I'm not just going to say ID equals red, because that doesn't mean anything. Why is it red? What if there was something else I wanted to make red? Do I still use that same ID or what? In this case, I'm giving an ID of maximum gas because that's what it is. I want to highlight the maximum gas bill on here. Now, how I highlight it could be done a bunch of different ways. I could say pound sign max gas and give it a color of red. If I did that, then it stands out that way. Now, remember, one of the rules for accessibility is if you use colors, highlight it some other way as well. Because someone that has trouble distinguishing red is probably going to see that as a shade of gray anyhow. And it's going to look a lot like this. So it's not going to stand out. So we could make it a little bit bigger. That makes it stand out. We could put a border around it. We could put it in italics. Which I have to look up how to do. Font style. Normal or oblique or italics. What is oblique? I guess we'll find out a lot like italics. More italic-y? OK. another way we could make it stand out. So again, rule of elect, uh, accessibility, right? Multiple presentations. We want to highlight that 
that the fact that the gas bill for January is so much higher than the gas bill for the rest of the month, right? So we chose one way by color, right? Because color is sort of a very vivid way to do that, you know? People are conditioned, you know, if you see something red, you know, that, that that has a special meaning, that that's something important that should be noticed, right? But not everyone can see red. So therefore, we do it another way as well. We put it in italics. So someone that can't see red, well, at the very least, they see this in italics. Now, that was with a class. Uh, I'm sorry, that was with an ID. Remember with an ID? An ID has to be unique. So if I say ID is max gas, I can't have anything else on the page that has an ID of max gas. And I designate it in the style sheet by putting a pound sign in front of it. Now, if again, there were other things I wanted to highlight, like maybe the electric bill in February is high. I could give a class instead. And that's designated in the style sheet with a dot. And I'll call it high bill. And I could give a class equals high bill. And I would do that for both of them. Because a class, you can assign to multiple things. Save my CSS file. There we go. OK. Sometimes what's useful is to have grid lines in your uh, in your uh, table. So you can accomplish that with a border. So I can say on the table, border, let's say two pixels, solid black. That will give us a border around the entire table. I could then around TD say Notice how there's a little like gap between the borders. All right? So I put a border around the whole table and I put a border around the TD. But notice that there's a little gap between the TD borders. All right? There's actually a special attribute called border collapse that will get rid of that little extra border. Maybe. Maybe you can't put that with the other border attributes. Oh, no, I put it on the wrong one. Or did I? Yeah, border collapse, collapse. That shouldn't matter. Uh, let's see. Oh, 
You don't put it on the TD, you put it on the table. It's for the whole table for the whole table, not for just part of the table. There we go. So what border collapse does is instead of like doubling the table the border like and putting a little blank line before it, it just sort of smashes all the borders together. So now instead of having before we had without this We have two pixels, a gap, two pixels. So there's actually five pixels sort of border. Here, the, all the border gets collapsed, and we just have two pixels. Now, I could give the THs a different color if I wanted to. Right? Something like that. And again, notice how, again, the choice of colors I'm making, I'm not doing anything too terribly radical about it. All right? And I mean, I would argue that this is a little more aesthetically pleasing than, let's get rid of all the CSS for a minute. that it looks better than that, but besides just how it looks, this sort of allows you to guide the user in seeing and understanding the parts of the table that you want, all right, that you want them to, all right? There are a few more tags and attributes relating to tables. We'll cover w at least one of them today, and then the rest will save till next time. There is a caption tag, and the caption tag shows you sort of the whole purpose of the table. This is useful for a couple reasons. It's useful for people that are viewing the table uh, with a screen reader. It helps them put the numbers and the data in context. All right? But it does the same thing for people that can see as well. So it's always good to have a caption on the table. So, caption, I'll say something like sample monthly budget. By default, it's going to be centered. All right. By the way, do keep in mind I made, I, I zoomed in on the table at the beginning of class that the table would normally look like this, but I zoomed in on the text. There's 100%. So if I want the caption to be left aligned and bigger, I could say, again, in the style rule, 
caption, text align, left, font size 1.2 EM. And it would look like that. Again, remember the electric bill is still a wider column than the rest. If I wanted the columns to be equal, all I would really need to do is size the size the TD. So I have five TDs in a row. I could say with 20%. And that will evenly divide it amongst the data. Now, if you give something that's impossible, the browser has to guess, right? So if I gave the width of these, the width of each column, 200 pixels, when I give the width of the whole table 70% of the available space, the browser has to make do and figure out what fits best. Okay? So be careful not to give the browser impossible things to try to do. Because if you do that, then you're kind of at the mercy of whatever the browser figures out the best way to handle it is. Okay. Next time we will talk about a couple more less used table tags. We'll talk about accessibility for tables as well. And we probably will get started on JavaScript. Um, I think that's about all uh, that we have next time. All right. We'll see you in lab.